Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. We'll start out with some jury charge. Ready? Here we go. Members of the jury, I will now instruct you as to the law that governs this case. You have been handed a copy of the instructions I will read. You should feel free to read along or to just listen to me. You will be able to take your copy of these instructions into the jury room. I, You have heard all of the evidence in the case as well as the final arguments of the parties. You have paid careful attention to the evidence and I am confident that you will act together with fairness and impartiality to reach a just verdict. There are three parts to these instructions. First, I'll give you general instructions about your role and how are you are to go about deciding the factual issues in this case. Second, I'll give you instructions concerning the law applicable to this particular case. Third, I'll give you final instructions about procedure. Please listen carefully. I'm reading these instructions from a prepared text because the law is made up of words and those words are very carefully chosen. This is not a time to ad lib, so when I tell you what the law is, it is critical that I use exactly the right words. My duty is to instruct you on the law. It is your duty to accept these instructions of law and to apply them to the facts as you determine them. With respect to legal matters, you must take the law as I give it to you. If any attorney has stated a legal principle different from any that I state to you in my instructions, it is my instructions that you must follow. You are to consider these instructions together as a whole. In other words, you are not to isolate or give undue weight to any particular instruction. You must not substitute your own notions or opinions of what the law is or what you think it ought to be. As members of the jury, you are the sole and exclusive judges of the facts. You decide what happened. You must determine the facts based solely on the evidence evidence received in this trial. Any opinion I might have regarding the facts is of absolutely no consequence. The personalities and the conduct of counsel in the courtroom are not in any way at issue. If you formed an opinion of any kind as to any of the lawyers in the case, favorable or unfavorable, whether you approved or disapproved of their behavior as advocates, that should not enter into your deliberations. From time to time, the lawyers and I had conferences at the bench and other conferences out of your hearing. These conferences involve procedural and evidentiary matters and should not enter into your deliberations at all. Lawyers have a duty to object when the other side offers testimony or other evidence that the lawyer believes is not admissible. It is my responsibility to rule on those objections. Why an objection was made is not your concern. You should not draw any inference simply from the fact that a lawyer objects to a question. If I sustain the objection, you may not consider the testimony or exhibit at issue. If I overrule the objection, you may consider the testimony or exhibit just as you would any other evidence in the case. You must evaluate the evidence calmly and objectively without prejudice or sympathy. You must be completely fair and impartial. Your verdict must be based solely on the evidence presented at this trial or the lack of evidence. Our system of justice cannot work unless you reach your verdict through a fair and impartial consideration of the evidence you may not consider in deciding the facts of the case. Any personal feelings you may have about the race, national origin, sex, or age of any party or witness, you must regard the parties as of equal standing in the community and of equal worth. All parties are entitled to the same fair trial at your hands. They stand equal before the law and are to be dealt with as equals in this court. The plaintiff in this case, Hannah Bovang, is an individual. Two of the defendants, NYG Capital LLC and FNL Media LLC are corporations. The remaining defendant, Benjamin Way, is an individual. The mere fact that NYG Capital LLC and FNL Media LLC are corporations does not entitle them to any greater or lesser consideration by you. All litigants stand equal before the law, and corporations are entitled to the same fair consideration you would give any other party. Right, we will stop there for now and let's try some literary material. Ready? Here we go. 
Mercedes-Benz GLC 3004 Matic, the German automaker, is on a tear redesigning, renaming, and adding to its SUV lineup. The 2016 GLC replaces the GLK, slotting between the smaller GLA and the larger GLE, formerly ML, SUVs, an entirely new vehicle. The GLC is no longer is longer and wider with considerably more interior space than its predecessor. It also, it's also nearly 200 pounds lighter. Weight loss plus a switch from six cylinder to four equals up to 20% better fuel economy. The GLC's horsepower is down from the GLK's, but even so, acceleration is adequate and the tow rating is 3,500 pounds. Moreover, the turbo four engine is super smooth and super quiet. The standard dynamic select system allows the driver to adjust throttle transmission and steering response to emphasize either efficiency or sportiness. The GLC suspension delivers a remarkably pleasant ride even over railroad tracks and other annoyances while effectively limiting body roll. The interior is typical Mercedes upscale materials, attractive design and fit and finish among the best in the business. The GLC cons the GLC comes loaded with no extra cost features from a power lift gate to collision prevention assist. Real, rear wheel drive is standard. All wheel drive is optional. Want more? Mercedes offers a myriad of other options, but watch your wallet. They'll rapidly ramp up a rear wheel drive. GLC's $39,875 base price. Nissan Murano Platinum all wheel drive. Maybe it's the French influence. After all, Japanese automaker Nissan is partnered with Renault of France in a transcontinental alliance and sculpted with more seductive curves than a Rodin bronze. The latest Murano styling is something that the French might love. Of course, it turns many Americans' heads to redesigned for 2015. The Murano is equally dramatic inside with wide armchair like front seats and upscale trim. Though stylish, the interior doesn't sacrifice function. The various controls, including those for the touchscreen entertainment system, are easy to find and to use, and the rear seat is spacious. Moreover, the cabin is pleasantly, pleasingly hushed at highway speeds. The Murano's suspension is tuned more for comfort than snappy handling. Still, the SUV stays planted well enough when rounding corners. Nissan's familiar 3.5 liter V6 resides under the hood, providing acceptable acceleration and decent fuel economy. The all-wheel drive test vehicle loaded with such options as a panoramic sunroof and a forward collision warning system carried a price tag north of $40,000, but a nicely equipped Full-wheel drive base S model at barely more than $30,000 seems like a bargain. All right, we will stop there and get back to some jury charge. Ready? Here we go. The preponderance of the evidence standard applies to all disputed issues in this case. To establish by a preponderance of the evidence means that the evidence of the party having the burden of proof must be more convincing and persuasive to you than the evidence opposed to it. A preponderance of the evidence means the greater weight of the evidence. The difference in persuasiveness need not be great. It requires only that you find the scales tip, however slightly, in favor of the party having the burden of proof that what that party claims is more likely than not true. If you find that the credible evidence as to a particular issue is evenly divided, then you must find in favor of the party not having the burden of proof on that issue. What is important here is the quality and persuasiveness of the evidence relied on by a party and not the number of witnesses or exhibits that party introduced or the length of time that party spent on a particular subject. In determining whether any fact has been proven by a preponderance of the evidence, you may consider the testimony of all of the witnesses and all of the exhibits, regardless of which party introduced this evidence. Simply because I have permitted certain evidence to be introduced does not mean that I have decided that it is important or significant. That is, for you to decide. In determining the fact, you must rely upon your recollection of the evidence. The evidence in this case includes the testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits received 
in evidence and stipulations or agreements as to certain facts entered into by the parties. Some of the testimony you heard in this case was taken at pretrial depositions. The deposition testimony was given under oath and should be treated by you just like testimony given from the witness stand here in the courtroom. As I instructed you at the outset of the trial, you are not to consider questions asked by the lawyers as evidence. It is the witnesses answers that are evidence, not the questions. The questions are significant only insofar as they put the answers in context. I sometimes asked witnesses questions. You should draw no inference from that. My questions were only intended for clarification or to expedite matters and were not intended to suggest any opinion on my part as to whether any witness was more or less credible than any other witness or any view as to what your verdict should be. When I ordered that testimony be disregarded or stricken from the record, you may not consider that testimony in rendering your verdict from time to time. I received evidence for a limited purpose. For example, there were occasions in which I instructed you that certain testimony was not being offered for its truth and could be considered only as to a witness's state of mind where evidence was received only for a limited purpose. You may consider it only for that purpose. To constitute evidence, exhibits must first be received in evidence. Exhibits marked for identification but not admitted are not evidence, nor are materials that were used only to refresh a witness's recollection. Arguments by the lawyers are also not evidence because the lawyers are not witnesses. What they have said to you in their opening statements and in their closing arguments may help you understand the evidence and assist you in reaching a verdict, but these arguments are not evidence. Moreover, if your recollection of the evidence differs from the statements made by the lawyers and their arguments to you, it is your recollection that controls. Finally, any statements that I may have made during the trial do not constitute evidence. Similarly, any statements or rulings I have made during the trial are not any indication of my views as to what your decision should be. The decision here is for you alone. It is for you alone to decide what weight, if any, should be given to the testimony and the exhibits received in evidence in the case. Generally, there are two types of evidence that you may consider in reaching your verdict. Direct evidence is testimony by a witness about something he or she knows by virtue of his or her own senses, something seen, felt, touched, or heard. For example, if a witness were to testify that when he or she left home this morning it was raining, that would be direct evidence about the weather. Direct evidence may also be in the form of an exhibit. Circumstantial evidence is evidence from which you may infer the existence of certain facts. For example, assume that when you came into the courthouse this morning, the sun was shining and it was a nice day. Assume that the courtroom blinds were drawn and you could not look outside. As you were sitting here, someone walked in with an umbrella, which was dripping wet. Then a few minutes later, another person entered with a wet raincoat. Now you cannot look outside the courtroom and you cannot see whether it is raining, so you have no direct evidence of that fact. But based on the facts that I have asked you to assume, you could conclude that it had been raining. That is all there is to circumstantial evidence. On the basis of reason, experience, and common sense, you infer from one established fact the existence or non-existence of some other fact. The matter of drawing inferences from facts and evidence is not a matter of guesswork or speculation. A proper inference is a logical factual conclusion that you might reasonably draw from other facts that have been proven. It is often the case that material facts, such as what a person was thinking or intending are not easily proven by direct evidence. Proof of such matters is often established by circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is of no less value than direct evidence. You should evaluate the credibility or believability of the witnesses by using your common sense. Common sense is your greatest asset as a juror. Ask yourself whether the witness appeared honest, open, and candid. Did the witness appear evasive or as though he or she was trying to hide something? How did the witness's responsiveness on direct examination compare to that witness's responsiveness on cross-examination? If you find that any witness has lied under oath at this trial or lied under oath in an earlier proceeding, you should view the testimony of that witness cautiously and weigh it with great care. It is for you to decide, however, how much of that witness's testimony, if any, you wish to believe. Few people recall every detail of every event precisely the same way a witness may be inaccurate, contradictory, or even untruthful in some respects and yet entirely believable and truthful in other respects. It is for you to determine whether such inconsistencies are significant or inconsequential and whether to accept or reject all or to accept some and reject the balance of that witness's testimony. In some, it is up to you to decide whether a witness's testimony is truthful and accurate in part and whole or not at all as well as what weight, if any, to give to that witness's testimony. 
In evaluating the testimony of any witness, you may consider, among other things, the witness's intelligence, the ability and opportunity the witness had to see, hear, or know the things that the witness testified about, the witness's memory, any interest, bias, or prejudice the witness may have, the manner of the witness while testifying, and the reasonableness of the witness's testimony in light of all the evidence in the case, including testimony from other witnesses and the exhibits that may have been received in evidence. All right, let's stop there. And we will try some literary material. This is called Old School Navigation. Ready? Here we go. Old School Navigation. Many of us hit the road with just a smartphone as our guide, but what would you do if technology failed you? The best way to avoid the panic and stress of getting lost is to plan ahead, know where you're going, and bring along some good paper maps. Plus, be aware that your phone might not work in certain areas, warns Auto Club cartographer Bill Scharf, who offers these map savvy tips. Know that maps are not all created equal. Guide maps and vicinity maps, like the ones from a hotel concierge or in a guidebook, show points of interest and major streets, but won't help if you turn down a side street. City maps are the most helpful if you get lost. Those are the only maps that are going to show every street, says Sharp. For exploring areas between cities or towns, regional maps provide more detail than do state maps, which show major routes. Read your map before you set out. Take a moment to or orient yourself. What are the major landmarks, such as tall buildings or major attractions, where you're headed? Where are they in relation to your hotel or to the direction you will be traveling? What are the major streets in town? Are you traveling toward a mountain range or along the coast? This information will help you get your bearings. If you do get lost, know how to virtually drop a pin in town head for the nearest cross street to find your place on the map or look for landmarks watch for signs that direct visitors to major attractions and you can use those to get reoriented on the interstate numbered exits can tell you whether you are traveling in the right direction on smaller roads look for cross streets and exit names or numbers natural landmarks such as mountains rivers and bodies of water also can help even if you have a poor sense of direction, you can strive to be like Sharp, who rarely gets lost. I don't go to places on the fly, he says. I do my research. Okay, we'll get back to some jury charge practice now. Ready? Here we go. You have heard evidence that at some earlier time, witnesses have said or done something that counsel argues is inconsistent with their trial testimony. Evidence of prior allegedly inconsistent statements was introduced to help you decide whether to believe the trial testimony of a witness. If you find that a witness made an earlier statement that conflicts with the witness's trial testimony, you may consider that fact in deciding how much of the witness's trial testimony, if any, to believe. In making this determination, you may consider whether the witness purposely made a false statement or whether it was an innocent mistake, whether the inconsistency concerns an important fact or whether it had to do with an insignificant detail, whether the witness had an explanation for the inconsistency and whether that explanation accords with your common sense. It is exclusively your decision based upon all the evidence and your own good judgment, whether the prior statement was inconsistent and if so, how much weight, if any, to give the inconsistent statement in determining whether to believe all or part of that witness's testimony. In deciding whether to believe a witness, you should consider any evidence that the witness is biased in favor of or against one side or the other. 
Likewise, you should consider evidence of any interest or motive that the witness may have in cooperating with one side or the other. You should also take into account any evidence that a witness may benefit in some way from the outcome of the case. It is your duty to consider whether any witness has permitted bias or interest to color his or her testimony. If so, you should view that witness's testimony with caution, weigh it with great care, and subject it to close and searching scrutiny. Of course, the mere fact that a witness has an interest in the outcome of this case does not mean that the witness has not told the truth. It is for you to decide from your observations and applying your common sense and experience whether the possible interest of any witness has intentionally or otherwise colored or distorted that witness's testimony. You are not required to disbelieve a witness with an interest in the outcome of this case you may accept as much of that witness's testimony as you deem reliable and reject as much as you deem unworthy of acceptance all right we will stop there that will conclude our literary and jury charge practice